2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let me ask you a question. How would you encourage a young pastor who preaches the word of God every week and yet every week when he comes to preach, he has less and less people to preach to? How would you encourage a young man who has just been informed that his dear friend and his spiritual mentor has been thrown into prison for his faith in Christ? How would you encourage any Christian who is having to navigate and go through the most intense persecution of Christians that had been seen up to that point in human history? Well, folks, that's the setting, that's the historical background or backdrop of the letter of 2 Timothy. You see, all of this is taking place during the reign of a one Emperor Nero of the Roman Empire. And if you know anything about history, you know that it was during Nero's reign that the most intense persecution of Christians and of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was taking place. Christians were dying. And those like Paul were being imprisoned. And Paul, even as he's writing this letter to Timothy, is saying, I know that the time of my departure is at hand. And it was a year after this letter was written that Paul was killed martyred for his faith in Christ through the Roman Empire. And you see, Timothy, the young man, the young pastor, he's right in the middle of it because he is pastoring a church right there in what we would call today modern-day Turkey. The New Testament would call it Asia, but it's really modern-day Turkey. In fact, his church was one of what we call the seven churches of Asia or the seven churches of Revelation that Jesus talks to in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And so they are part of the Roman Empire at that time. And they are feeling very directly the heat that is coming upon them as Christians. And it is in this historical backdrop that the uh, Apostle Paul wants to remind young Timothy as the pastor of his church so that he can then in turn teach and share this with others that we, through God, have a remarkable spirit. We have been given the Holy Spirit of God. And as Paul's going to tell Timothy, he has taken up permanent residence inside of us. And because we have a remarkable spirit within us, we then have the uh, capacity to have a spirit of fearlessness, a spirit of faithfulness, a spirit of fortitude, and a spirit of friendship. And those are the things I want us to look at this morning. Keeping in mind what I have shared about the, the climate that, that is happening here and why that really then brings to bear these words even maybe mean more to us as we read what Paul wrote. You see, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, realized he needed to encourage this young pastor, Timothy. He needed to encourage this young man so that in turn he could encourage his church because the Christians and the church they were feeling the heat, literally, just like we are this morning. So notice what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 6, speaking first about this remarkable spirit and the spirit of fearlessness that you and I can have through the Holy Spirit of God. He says, because of this, Timothy, because of what? Because of his sincere faith, verse 5, that he has talked about there, that first existed in his grandmother and mother and now has been passed down to him. Not that we get our faith genetically or through our ancestors, but each of us have to make that personal decision. But it was through the influence of his grandmother and his mother. It was through him seeing that faith lived out in his grandmother and mother every day that Timothy then came to personally 
choose faith in Jesus Christ himself. And Paul says, because of the fact that I know you have faith in Jesus Christ, then I also know you have this remarkable spirit within you. And he says, because of that, I want to remind you to rekindle God's gift that you possess through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You see, Timothy was naturally, we know this from other places, he was naturally sort of an introverted, timid person. Uh, and, and a lot of what God was calling him to was calling him to put himself up out there and to step up and to step out. And especially in the climate in, in which he was existing, Oh, that caused Timothy a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress and a lot of worry and a lot of fear. That's why Paul even told Timothy, Timothy, your stomach is always bothering you, right, because of your fear. And he said, besides you needing to grow out of that through your relationship with God and through learning to rely and depend upon the spirit who lives within you more, also do this. Drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. Because Paul knew he... They were close friends. He, he knew that this young man really struggled with fear. And so he is telling him, look, through this remarkable spirit of God, you and I can have a spirit of fearlessness because fear doesn't come from God. In fact, this word fear speaks about not the opposite of fear being courage, but the opposite of fear being faith. You see, fear is actually faithlessness being manifested in our life. It is spiritual weakness being manifested in our life. Because if we truly believed and trusted and placed our confidence in the Lord and in what he said to us in his word, there is nothing we would fear. And we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us who is not going to bring about fear in our life. That comes through our fallen human nature that is not yet truly trusting and fully trusting in God. But he can supply us with a fearlessness to be able to live life no matter what's going on. No matter who's in charge, like Nero at that point, and, and what he sees happening around him. My friend and mentor Paul is now maybe you know, going to lose his life in prison. God, what are you doing? What are you allowing to happen? And certainly this is a timely message because you and I live in a day and age where if we were to, you know, look at what's going on around in the world and, and read the newspaper and watch the news and all of that, you and I could begin to have fear well up in us real quickly. Even in our own lives, sometimes the things that, that happen to us, fear could could get a foothold real quickly. And it's only through our engagement and connection with God through his spirit every day that you and I can truly wake up every day with a spirit of fearlessness. Fearlessness. He goes on to say, and love. And Nicole mentioned this just a few minutes ago. 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love because Perfect love drives out fear. You see, if you and I truly receive the love that God has for us, if we truly begin to comprehend and wrap our minds around and grasp the love that God has for us, what could we fear? Which is why Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God. It doesn't matter whether you, you know, go through all of these different things. He said, there is nothing that you and I could ever go through on this earth that could ever separate us from God's love. And if we truly believe that God loves us, then where is that fear welling up within us? Part of why we live in fear and we live with anxiety and worry and all of that in our lives is simply because we've never really absorbed and received and begun to understand the love that God has for us. He, he will never turn his back on us. He will never abandon or forsake us. So even when we're going through difficult times and difficult days, it's not like the love of God is not flowing into our lives and that through his spirit, no matter what we're having to endure, that we can't live with a spirit of fearlessness. And then he goes on to say, and self-control. 
Because again, only through the power and enabling of the Holy Spirit can you and I truly have the discipline to be able to control our thoughts and where our thoughts and our mind goes so that instead of our mind going and defaulting towards fear and worry and anxiety, it rests in the Lord. It trusts in the Lord. And we can learn to discipline and train our mind to do that through the self-control. Don't forget, self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit that we learned about in Galatians chapter 5. So that's why Paul says to Timothy, notice verse 8, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, a prisoner for his sake, but by God's power, not in our own power and strength, but only by God's power, accept your share of suffering for the gospel. Okay, Timothy, I get it. I'm in prison. I'm probably not going to make it out of prison. Nero is now the ruler of the world as we know it. The Roman Empire and all of its resources are coming down on Christians hard. They're being murdered all over the place. Being a Christian now is as dangerous as it's ever been since the start of the church at Pentecost. And yet Paul is saying, Timothy, don't be afraid. Step up. Step out. Step into whatever God has for you. Don't, don't, don't fear being a pastor. Don't, don't fear being a spiritual leader at a time like this. This is when we need strong, courageous leaders who have no fear in the times in which we live. And if that was true then, that is also true today. We need Christians who are willing to stand up in the age in which we live and manifest this spirit of fearlessness no matter what trusting in the Lord and allowing the Spirit of God to give us that fearlessness that we need to not be ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. And so many Christians, when the pressure of the world starts to bear upon us and it becomes less and less popular to be a Christian, then we begin to just sort of close in and, and retreat and isolate ourselves. And God says, that's not what I called my people to. I called my people to stand strong in the midst of whatever society and culture and whatever they have to deal with. And we could go back to the very historical background of this letter and say, if they could do it during the reign of Nero, when they were seeing literally Christians killed around them and imprisoned around them, then you and I can stand up for the Lord Jesus today in the age in which we live. And even if they take our life, it cannot separate us from the love of God. Even if they take our life, Paul said, the word of God says to depart and be with Christ is far better. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. So what can they take from us? We must, through the spirit of God, live and manifest a spirit of fearlessness. But there's also another thing here, Paul says. Through this remarkable spirit, we can also have a spirit of faithfulness. Begin reading with me in verse 12 of chapter 1. Paul says, because of this, in fact, I suffer as I do. I never back down from teaching, no matter how unpopular it was about Jesus Christ and about his gospel. And I'm not ashamed. And Paul says, here's why I'm not ashamed because I know the one in whom my faith is set. And I'm convinced that he is able to protect what has been entrusted to me until that day. Paul's saying, the reason I can live faithfully is because I have such confidence in my God. I know him. I know I can rely on him. I know I can depend upon him. I know that he will always be faithful to me. Therefore, it inspires me to be faithful to him and to his word and to his kingdom and to his cause. Which is why he then says this, verse 13. Hold to the standard of sound words that you heard from me and do so with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. At the beginning of verse 13, I would like you to think about those words this way. Paul is literally saying this to Timothy. Timothy, no matter how unpopular it is to preach the word of God, no matter every Sunday, if you show up at your church at Ephesus and you have less and less people showing up to hear you, he says, never lower the standard found in God's word. 
That's what verse 13 means. Never lower the standard. Don't water down the message of God to make it more appealing or accommodating because you're afraid you may lose people and people might get offended and people might walk away. We saw last week, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, in the last days, there's going to be a substantial number of people who walk away from the faith, who walk away from church, who walk away from God, who walk away from their Christian friends, who walk away from the word of God. And Paul Paul says, you know this, Timothy, so it shouldn't be a surprise to you. And God never told us that we were supposed to be popular. All God calls us to be is faithful, faithful to him and faithful to his word. And I tell you this today. If over the next few years, even as we move into our new building, if people continue to trickle out of the church rather than come into the oasis, I'm telling you, that's not going to bother me. <laughs> Even if I'm the last one there and I'm just sort of preaching to myself. Because I'm at a place in my life where God has just set my face like a flint. And I'm going to teach the word no matter what the consequences are. Amen. Because that's what God calls us all to be. And there's too many pastors and too many ministries and too many churches, especially in America today, who are watering down the message of God's word because they're afraid, well, somebody might get offended and walk out. And let me just add this, because we all know it to be true, and take their money with them. Because that's really what the issue is. And where's their trust and faith in God? See, to me, if God's in something, then God will make sure that the resources are there to do what God's called me to do. And he will work through his people. And he will make it happen because Paul said in Philippians 4.19, my God can supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps me to do this. That's why in verse 14, Paul says, protect that good thing entrusted to you. What is that good thing in the context? It is the beautiful and beneficial truth of God, the truth of God that Jesus Christ himself said, only this kind of truth can set a man free, can set a woman free, can set a life free. If you know the truth, the problem is, again, many people today don't want to hear the truth. They're putting their fingers in their ears and saying, I don't want to hear the truth of God. But the word protect is a very interesting word. It's actually a military word. It is a word that speaks about exercising unbroken vigilance as a military guard. So get the picture here. Paul's telling Timothy, a young pastor, young man, you've got to protect this beautiful, beneficial truth that has been handed down to you from the very first apostles and eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ himself. You now are responsible to protect it. You see, each and every generation of Christians that comes on the scene on earth, you and I are responsible for, before God to do the very same thing, to protect this to make sure that what we hand down to the next generation is exactly what was handed down to us. In fact, maybe even in better condition than what we had it handed to us in. And the only way to do that, notice Paul says, is through the Holy Spirit who lives within us. You and I will never be able to protect the beautiful and beneficial truth of God entrusted to us any other way than by relying and depending upon the Spirit, again, who has taken up permanent residence within us. So we have the spirit of faithfulness, a spirit of fearlessness. Now notice verse 15, a spirit of fortitude. Because Paul says to Timothy, you know that everyone in the province of Asia deserted me. Remember now, going back to the beginning of the message, province of Asia would have been pretty much modern day Turkey. It was where those seven churches of Revelation all existed, and it's where Timothy, smack dab, that's where he was the pastor, right in the middle of all that. So now think about this and even how it relates to Timothy. Paul's saying, Timothy, 
you know that everyone where you're at right now has turned their backs on me. Wow, how hard would that have been for Timothy to be pastoring a church where most of the people in his church have turned their backs on the Apostle Paul? We don't want nothing to do, we don't, we don't want nothing to do with Paul. He's getting what he deserves. How would that have made Timothy feel? He says, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. Aren't they great names? <laughs> Maybe not what they did, but... In other words, Paul is reminding Timothy, the defections that I have experienced in my own life are staggering, Timothy. I know what it's like to have people who turn their back on me because I have stayed true to the Lord. And I have been fearless in my witness and testimony for Jesus Christ. He says, I know what that's like, Timothy. And I'm telling you, the only reason that I can keep on keeping on and that I don't get discouraged and, and, and I don't, you know, get filled with despair and start going, why am I doing this? And is it all worth it? And all? He says, the reason I can keep going and have this kind of fortitude even up to the very end where later on in 2 Timothy he says, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I kept the faith up into the very end. How did Paul have that fortitude? Through the Holy Spirit who lives within him. And how are you and I going to navigate life knowing, knowing ahead of time that there will be relationships there will be family members, there will be friends, there will be people in our lives who will continually walk away from us and turn their backs on us. What then in that moment can keep us going and give us a spirit of fortitude and endurance and perseverance to keep on going when people around us seem to be walking away from us? The Holy Spirit who lives within us. That's what. That's what does it. We shouldn't be surprised when people walk out of our lives. <laughs> That's part of living. And especially if you and I are going to be fearless and faithful to the Lord, there will be relationships that we lose along the way. And if we ended there, it could sort of be a wah wah. But guess what? As we said at the very beginning, but God is always faithful to us. God is always there. God never leaves us nor forsakes us nor abandons us. So we always have Him in our lives. But guess what, too? There's usually at least one or a couple of friends. That no matter what we go through in life and what we endure and what we are called upon to deal with, they will stick by our side. They have what I call here the spirit of friendship. And that kind of spirit can again only be empowered through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul wanted to encourage Timothy by someone in his own life that exemplified this spirit of friendship. And I want to share with you some of the qualities of spiritual friendship this morning. Notice right on the heels of this staggering defection that Paul points out in verse 15, then he changes to verse 16. May the Lord grant mercy, magnify his favor to the family of Onesphorus. Oh, there's another great name because he often refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my imprisonment. But when he arrived in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well all the ways he served me in Ephesus. Folks, Onesphorus, exemplifies for us, models for us, is a great example for us of the spirit of friendship. And Paul, yes, even Paul, needed 
a friend. Yes, he had the Lord, but he needed a friend. And Onesphorus was that friend. That while Paul was sitting there in that dark, dank, damp prison cell in Rome with hardly anything to eat or drink, knowing that his days on earth were numbered, it would be so encouraging for Paul to know that he had somebody in his life, some human being that didn't turn their backs on him, but was there for him. And I want to share with you three qualities of spiritual friendship this morning that Onesphorus exemplified. First, notice in verse 16, Paul says, he often or frequently refreshed me. You know why I love that word? Because that word really speaks about you and I being the flesh and blood embodiment of an oasis. It's a place where those who need shade can find shade. It's a place where those who need a cool drink on a hot day can find it through their friendship and relationship with us. See, God wants us to be refreshing, especially to our brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants us to be a person that when people get around us, instead of walking away from us feeling drained, like, oh my goodness, I spent five minutes with them and I feel like I got all the air sucked out of me. <laughs> that we actually walk away sort of like with a skip in our step going, man, Nothing has changed. My circumstances haven't changed. But man, I felt refreshed just being in their presence. And the only way you and I can be a refreshment like that to others is when you and I allow the great refresher, the Holy Spirit, to refresh us on a daily basis. Again, it goes back to the importance of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now listen, God doesn't expect for us to be this kind of friend to everybody because we can't. But God does expect his children to be this kind of a friend to somebody. Who is it that I can refresh? And make sure that there's hopefully at least one or two people in your life that really look out to refresh you. Because that's a characteristic of a spirit of friendship that God loves. The next is, notice verse 17, when he arrived in Rome, he eagerly searched for me. It means he pursued me. He tracked me down. He had persistence in the face of much discouragement. Why do I say that? Well, think about it. And this is why Paul even said, may the family of Onesphorus gain favor from God. Because this man Onesphorus traveled probably many, many hundreds, if not a thousand miles from where he was in Asia all the way over to Rome. He was not familiar with Rome at all. He left his family there to serve Paul. So that's why Paul recognizes what Onesphorus has done not only means that Onesphorus had that kind of a heart, but his family was willing to give him up for a time so that he wouldn't be there, but that he could be with Paul. It's sort of the same idea we have today of those and who have always served in our military. That it's not just the actual men and women who are serving in the military who make those sacrifices. It's their family members as well. And Paul's saying the same thing about Onesimus. Because when you and I are in ministry, there's going to be times where you and I are called to have a season of ministry where our family might have to sacrifice. And so Paul said, God, may you magnify your favor to even the family of Onesphorus, because I know they've made a sacrifice too. But I love this. It means he searched for me. If you have a friend who will pursue you, who will track you down. If you're like that with someone else, it's a friend who is willing to go through anything for us or anything with us. And you think about it. He got to this strange big city called Rome, many, many miles away from it. He didn't know anybody there. And he starts going around to all these prisons where Christians were held saying, is the Apostle Paul here? Is the Apostle Paul there? And you can imagine what he endured as he went from prison to prison around Rome. 
I'm sure he got some hairy eyeballs, as we say. I'm sure he was insulted. I'm sure he was slandered. He was even knowing that he was maybe even putting his own freedom and maybe even his life on the line as he searched for Paul. But he was a friend because he said, Paul, I am willing to go through anything for you and I'm willing to go through anything with you. And that's the spirit of friendship. Not only someone who will refresh us, not only someone that we can refresh, but someone that we can have that kind of friendship with. Again, God doesn't call us to be that kind of a friend to everyone, but God does expect us to be that kind of a friend to someone. And then finally, verse 18, you know very well all the ways he served me in Ephesus. The word served here could also be translated cared for because that's really what Paul's saying. I had a friend in my life who cared for me. He was always looking out for me. You see, sometimes we get this erroneous idea in our heads that, you know, Paul was this great Christian and, and he was able to do it all on his own. Oh yeah, he had the Lord, but he didn't need anybody else. No, that's not the message that Paul ever, that's not the impression Paul ever gives. Paul says, I needed a friend. And he said, I had a friend in Onesphorus. He refreshed me, he searched for me, and he served me. How was Onesphorus able to be that kind of a friend to Paul? Through the Holy Spirit of God who lived within him. See, Paul is saying, you and I as Christians have a remarkable spirit that lives within us. A spirit that will enable us to be fearless, faithful, have fortitude in our life, and, and show friendship to someone in our life who needs that friendship. So I end with this. If you go back to verse 6 of chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, let's end where we began. Paul says, because of this, I remind you to rekindle it means to stir up the fire, fan the flame. Take the embers that are in that fireplace and stir them around a little bit to keep that fire going and that fire burning hot. Why? Because you have God's gift within you. And I think Paul here is talking about two things, and they're not exclusive to each other. I think he's talking about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the gift of God, but I think he's also talking about the giver of the gifts of God, which is also the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is both the gift and the giver of God's gifts. And if you and I have the Holy Spirit, we not only have the gift of God living within us, we have the one who bestows these supernatural abilities, these gifts of God within us. And why does he do that? So that you and I can build up the church so that we can display fearlessness and faithfulness and fortitude and friendship towards others. And Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, just like a fire has to have constant attention or else it will go out, the fire of the Holy Spirit within you, you need to constantly pay attention to it. You need to constantly fan the flame of, of your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need to stir up the fire of the Holy Spirit within you because apart from that, you and I as Christians will never step out. We will never step up. We will never step toward what God has for us and what he wants us to do and be. We will shrink back. And Paul is afraid that because of what Timothy is seeing all around him in the Roman Empire now, and because of what Paul or what Timothy has seen in his own mentor and friend happen to Paul, that somehow Timothy will shrink back from being the young man and the pastor that God called him to be and wants him to be. And Paul is saying, Timothy, stir up the Spirit of God within you. Keep that flame burning. Because it's only through our engagement with our Holy Spirit who has taken up residence within us can we manifest fearlessness, faithfulness, fortitude, and friendship. Could we stand, please, and close in prayer? God, I pray today that we would stir the flame and fan the fire 
of the Holy Spirit. And God, even as we sing about the Holy Spirit and we sing to the Holy Spirit, as we sing to one another and ending this service today, I pray, God, that if the Holy Spirit is moving and working and calling some of us to step forward and to step up, to step towards something, that we won't shrink back in fear, that we will allow your spirit that lives within us to give us that spirit of fearlessness, faithfulness, fortitude, and friendship. God, stir your people today so that we can be a light because you have told us that we are the light of the world. And who lights a light and then hides it? No, Jesus said, let your light show, shine before men that they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.